Hello everyone, Bill Geisley here from Geisley Automatics. And today I'm with Matt Sibio, our Director of Engineering. Hello everyone. And we have a live stream tonight to show you one of our new guns that we're coming out with. It's been a long time since we uh, had a live stream with all the things that happened in the last couple years. We never got to it. And you've kind of seen Geisley laying low with new products. A couple years ago, we were always coming out with new things, new accessories, things like that. But to be quite frank, we've been really concentrating on military projects over the last couple years. And we've had some really notable wins. Uh, some people are aware of them, some are not. I'll talk about those a little bit later in the live stream. Um, but to start off, I want to just let you know that this is going to be pretty long. None of this is scripted. This is live. There's a live audience out here. Um, and uh, there's going to be some commentary, but I want to start off with the words of my late mother when I showed her the first YouTube video of me explaining how to install SCAR trigger. I handed her the Blackberry and my mom. She was a Hungarian refugee from communist Hungary who came over here in 1957. She pulled her glasses down and she looked at the Blackberry and she said, Billy, you have diarrhea of the mouth. So I want to start with that, okay? Just so you know. A little bit ago, all right, this year, we won a major contract. We call it the Border Patrol contract. We are now on contract with the federal government for a series of rifles for the U.S. Border Patrol and DHS. This was a long, hard-fought contract. Um, the government wanted very stringent requirements, accuracy requirements, weight requirements, balance of the rifle requirements. They were very keen on having a chrome lined barrel. And Geisley put together a gun for the U.S. government. But as, as we all know, the U.S. government isn't necessarily funding uh, their law enforcement the way law enforcement should be funded. And they were on a very tight bud budget. So we had to kind of change the Geisley engineering viewpoint in order to develop a gun that was cost effective for the U.S. government. See, with Geisley, we put every ounce of engineering that we can into the weapon. Doesn't matter the cost, doesn't matter how much time we have to spend. We look at every part and we try to make it better, whether it's a better steel, a better heat treatment, um, anything that we can do in order to make that weapon better. But as you start doing these things, it also increases cost. And with this Border Patrol rifle, it was very, very cost sensitive. Now, I don't have one here to show you, but as we learned how to pull some cost out of the gun, it came up in conversation uh, with, with two of my teammates, hey, what if we could make a gun using some of that engineering knowledge and technology and um, bring it out under the ALG name. So what is ALG? That's my wife's company. Years ago, eight, nine years ago, um, as we were mostly selling triggers, my wife wanted to have a gun company of her own. So we started it and she started to make mil-spec, enhanced mil-spec style triggers. Eventually she morphed into rails, some other small accessories and things like that. We've also made some guns under the ALG name. I'm not sure if we ever sold them, but we decided to bring this under ALG. So ALG is a sister company of Geisley, and it stands for my wife's initials. That's, that's what ALG is, ALG Defense. We decided to bring this gun out for that. Now, this gun is designed for a shooter who wants a mil-spec class gun at a solid price point. And that's what ALG is all about, bringing value and performance to the market. Value takes secondary importance with guys, I'll be quite frank. If we're going to have the ultimate extractor, I'm going to use stainless steel that costs $40 a pound. And that is super difficult to machine and requires a machine that costs about a half million dollars. And that's all it does is run our extractors. Because if I use a lower tier machine, it will not get through the very tough Carpenter 465 on a Geisley rifle. But ALG is different. We have to bring value to the market. So this rifle is this right here. The 
This is called the ALG L Hefe. And in my uh, dialect, I speak a very um, unique dialect of Spanish. It's called Gringo Espanol, and that <laughs> means the boss. Now, I'm going to explain why this is the boss. This gun is $1,199, and it contains some very good technology that makes this gun a complete rifle system for you, the shooter. Instead of having to put on your own red dot or your own scope, it comes with one. Instead of having to grab a sling, it comes with one. It has QD swivels, QD mounts, has it included in the box. And that's what El Jefe is. So let's go over this gun part by part, and I'll explain it and explain how we made it. All right. Let's start, start right here. Matt, this is the... B5. Sop mod Sop enhanced. Mod. Yep. All right, it has little battery compartments here. You know this stock. Sometimes it's called, it is called the Sop mod stock. B5 makes a very nice stock, and what's really nice about it is you get a beautiful cheek weld on these angled areas right here. A cheek weld to me is very, very important. I'm a distinguished rifleman. Went distinguished at Camp Perry, I think, in 2002. And if you shoot high-power rifle, if you don't have a cheek weld, you are not competing in, in the top brackets. You have to have a cheek weld in your weapon. I know a lot of people today don't like that. They want very tall um, scope mounts, so they sit up like this. But to me, that is not the way to go. B5 Sop Mod stock, extremely, extremely nice stock. We're going to move to the lower receiver, the buffer tube, six position. 7075 T6 aluminum, impact extruded, and this is the mil spec version. Let's look at the buffer plate. Kevin? Kevin, can we get a close up? We're going to get a close up. All right, the buffer plate, remember this gun is made by Geisley for ALG. The buffer plate is 17 4, precipitation hardening stainless steel. This buffer plate here. There we go, is a non-rotating QD buffer plate. Fits in here nice and slim, and it has a nitrided finish. Even though it's stainless steel, it's got even more corrosion resistance to it. The lower receiver, you'll see the new ALG Defense logo. Let me try to get this. Point towards the left. There we go. New ALG Defense logo right here. This is serial number 16. You'll see ALG Defense, North Wales, Pennsylvania, same town that guys the automatic is in. This is also 7075 T6 aluminum. This is also forged. It's a forged receiver, just like a mil spec receiver. So what is forging and how is this receiver made? You hear billet receivers, you hear forged receivers. What's the description? Back in the 1960s, in 1950s when this gun was designed there wasn't the ability to produce all these very nice curves and very nice features strictly by machining it wasn't possible nowadays it's easy to do you can purchase a five axis milling machine and the right programming software and you can program that so a little end mill goes back and forth and creates all the very nice features that you have this is in billet receivers but even today, a lot of built receivers are blocky and chunky and don't have a lot of curves to them. And the reason is that takes machining time. But you could take this out of a block of aluminum and machine it. But back in the day, they weren't able to do that. But what they were able to do was make one lower receiver like this. A tool maker was able to do this, and he did it instead of a receiver, he made a forged die. And the forging die, until it's recut, probably can forge about 5,000 uppers or 5,000 lowers, depending upon which die it is, before it needs to be recut until you start getting small um, defects in the forge. So now, all your material right here that I'm pointing to, all these areas, all right, this nice curve up here, this is all in the forging. So you only cut one, and yet you make multiple ones of that. Forging also increases the strength of any material that's forged. The grain flow goes around the features rather than through them. 
And in the Geisley bolt, this is one of the key features of the Geisley bolt. The Geisley bolts are forged. The grain flow flows around the lugs rather than through the lugs. Thinking of taking a, uh, a piece of wood and you're going to split it with an axe. You put it on end, you split it, splits open. Turn it on its side, hit it with an axe, it's pretty tough to get through. And that's what forging does, and that's what helps this receiver be extremely strong. Once these are forged, these are then machined on the horizontal machining center, and you'll, you'll notice the very nice anodizing on this. We try to do a very good job with anodizing. We do very well with colors. Uh, this is matte black, and you'll notice behind me, if you can see it, you'll see these other colors over here to the side. I'll explain those a little later. All right, let's move to the trigger. This is the heart of this gun made by ALG Defense. It is the ACT Combat Trigger. This is differentially hard-coded for an extremely nice combat trigger pull. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six pounds, but it is not gritty, and you can feel almost imperceptible creep. It is an extremely good trigger for law enforcement officers where the department is uh, worried about performance, quote unquote, triggers. We've sold thousands upon thousands of these to law enforcement departments all across the United States. We've had departments completely switch over to this trigger. That's right here. All right, mil spec uh, takedown pins, mil spec bolt catch made out of 8620 steel. And Matt, feel free to jump in if I'm saying something wrong. All right, let's go to the grip. This is a Geisley grip. It's called the A17. We were debating whether to go with the A22 or the A17. What's the difference? It's the grip angle. The A22 also has uh, the finger swell of the devil who invented it himself, all right, which many people dislike. Kevin, can you get that? All right. Many people dislike that finger swell. Here's the A22. All right. I have to. By, by the way, for those watching on YouTube, head over to uh, Facebook or Twitch. YouTube does not like it. Yeah, we got taken down. I think. All right. Yeah, YouTube, YouTube yeah. got taken down. YouTube news. Head All right. Head to Twitch or uh, Facebook. All right. So the finger swell. Why is it on there? I made my engineers put it on there. I'm used to shooting the A2 pistol grip in high power. You can't change it out because of the rules, and I love a finger swell. That's why it's on there. But the recriminations online, when people saw that finger swell, like I said, it's a spawn of the devil. We developed the A17. The grip angle is also different. The A22 mimics the A2 grip angle. The A17 mimics the 17-degree grip angle of a 1911 45 ACP. Yeah. All right, this was developed by John Moses Browning and his brother, and I am sure that the way they determined it is by making a wooden mock-up and pointing it out and saying which is the best <laughs> grip angle here, and they developed it. Yep. It makes an extremely upright shooting gripping position. And people love it. That's what this gun has on it. All right, here we go to our selector right here, all right? This is our own selector. This is not, and you can see it kind of looks like a mil spec selector, but you'll notice how that moves forward. This isn't hanging off the end like an M4 right here, this, this bulge where your finger goes. This is our posi snap. Selectors are a problem. They're actually a problem for the U.S. military. The U.S. military was actually thinking going back to a fully machined detent on here because there's so much problems. The detents today in the selectors are cast and sometimes defects get through it and this is where you feel a lot of grittiness, a lot of other detents in there instead of going smoothly from one to the other, there can be a lot of hang up. So we have, this is called the posi snap. This positively snaps from one side to the other there is no in-between on this. This is a nice little feature. It's a Geisley selector, and it's something that makes your, uh, your gun, especially for um, a police officer, you can never have it in between the selector positions. All right. Let's go to the buffer. A lot of value here in this gun. 
Geyser Super 42 braided wire buffer spring. This is a little bit different than the buffer spring that go in our Super Duties. This is mill spec weight. Geisley Super 42s are 15%, yes, 15% stronger. All right, this one is not. This has an H1 buffer. And if you're wondering what H1 means, there's three individual weights inside. When you see the number, the number indicates the number of tungsten weights rather than steel weights. So three steel is an H0, one steel is an H1, one tungsten is an H1, H2 is three tungsten, is two tungstens, <laughs> and H3 <laughs> is three tungsten. tungstens. There, there we go. I, I, I did pass differential equations when I got my engineering degree, just so you know. <laughs> All right. Let's move to the bolt carrier, the heart of the system right here. One way that we were able to pull cost out of this is to not put our El Presidente, let's put it that way, Geisley REBCG in this weapon. The Geisley REBCG is nano weapon coated. This is an exclusive coating that Geisley provides and it's done in-house in a laboratory type room that's temperature and humidity controlled and we have PE CVD coating machines of our own and an entire crew that does nothing but put nano weapon on. Nano weapon is a coating designed by Picatinny Arsenal. They call it DSL, durable solid lubricant. And we have modified and changed it into the ultimate firing uh, uh, firearm coating. However, it's expensive to put on. There's a lot of hand work that needs to be done to any part that gets it coated. And so what this is, this is military spec MAGFOS. The carrier is military spec 8620 steel. The cam pin is mil spec 4140 chrome molly steel. The gas key is 4130 mil spec chrome molly steel. And the bolt is Carpenter 158. Carpenter 158, the Carpenter steel mill is right down the road from us in Reading, Pennsylvania, about 45 minutes. And uh, we've got a really good relationship with those guys. And we purchased Carpenter 158 in huge 10 ton or 20 ton lots. That's what we need for our bolts. And this is a Carpenter 158 and has a 4140 steel extractor. It's also MAGFOS coated, not the Carpenter 465 stainless steel extractor that guys uses. But a very good mill spec quality BCG right here. The internal bores on the carrier are chrome plated. The ID of the, of the gas key is hard chrome plated. And you'll see, Kevin, if you want to come over here. Face the light, there it is. The G on the side, stamped into the side. All right, that's how you know it's a Geisley carrier. All right, let's come on up here to the charging handle. This is a mil spec forge charging handle. It does not have a Geisley charging handle. Another way to save money. The upper receiver, again, forge mil spec 7075 T6 aluminum. This aluminum was developed by the Sumitomo Corporation in World War II and was first used in the Japanese Zero fighter. All right. Thank Let's you very much. go to the rail. Okay. This is the ALG V3 rail. Now, I can't call it V3. I have to call it the V03 because V3 is trademarked by another gun company, very much friends of ours. So we're calling it the V03, which is okay. This rail has a round profile. It's very easy to hold this and put your thumb over it. It's a popular way to hold the handguard today. You'll notice that it is round. It does not have the traditional M-lock protrusions like other rails. This has what we call low-vis M-lock. It still meets the M-lock specification, but is machined into the round rail, has longitudinal grooves in it, very good, very nice to grip, very secure. Picatinny all the way on top, lightning cuts on the top, and of course, this uses the ALG barrel nut, which is, going, which is right here. Kevin, if you want to take a shot of that. Abraham, can you bring me that purple wrench? The 
These have not been available for a while, all right, the ALG reels, okay? We have a unique way of timing this. You'll see that the gas tube is in the center of that groove, and that involves this very highly engineered wrench. And if, if you guys have these, you know how it's kind of like voodoo to put these on, but as soon as you do your first one, it's like the most brainless thing ever. What this does, however, is this is a very large diameter, very large surface area with screws in the side. Once you time it and put it on, this is probably one of the most secure barrel nuts out there. The rail is extremely rigid and, uh, and it's a very nice system. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk barrels? Yep, we'll talk that? barrels. Yeah, All right. Geisley rifles come with hammer forged barrels. We're coming out with a line of six arc guns pretty soon. These are going to have Geisley cut rifle barrels on them. So in-house, Geisley has three ways of making gun barrels. Button, cut, and hammer forged. They all do things differently, and in some ways they do things better than the, than other, than the other methods or between these three methods. And we choose, depending upon the application, what we're doing. Here, this is button rifled. And what button rifled is, Let me show you a button. Okay. All right, you see this long rod. This long rod gets placed through the blank. And Kevin, can you zoom in on that? All right, let's see. I'm going to put my hand behind it. All right, there it goes. Can you see the grooves cut in that? This is black because it's PVD coated. All right but this does not cut the rifling in the barrel, it swages it. So it displaces metal rather than removes it. The advantage of this is it's very quick. You can put, you can button rifle a barrel in literally approximately a minute. This pulls through very quickly and boom, your rifling is now engraved into the barrel. This is the mill spec way of doing rifle barrels. This is how the M4 barrel is made. The steel is a special chromoly vanadium. I need the mill spec here. This is not commodity merchant bar. <laughs> it adheres to mill dash B1159 vision E right here. This is the mini Bible for military steel that goes in small arm barrels right here. You can download this online. It's a great read. It goes into what makes a military grade barrel steel well. And if you open it up, okay, there's basically three right here. Okay, Kevin? All right, let's look at them down here. All right, Kevin, you can zoom in. All right, you got ordnance 4150. Ordnance 4150 resulfurized, and you have chrome moly vanadium, CMB. There's three different types of steel. Along with this goes inspection requirements and very important low temperature impact resistance tests that have to be done on the steel that meets this mill spec. We use chrome moly vanadium, not the 4150. 4150, as soon as you start getting uh, more carbon in your barrel, it becomes more difficult to work. And that's why you see the middle one here, 4150, resulfurized. It has sulfur put back into the steel to make it easier to machine. And sulfur is a blessing and it's a curse. Back in the day, steel makers did not know how to remove sulfur and there was excessive sulfur in some steels. Notably, a notable historical fact is the steel in the titanic hull plates that had excessive amounts of sulfur in it but it also makes steel easy to machine. And if you look at the um, drawing for an M1 carbine, uh, not an M1 carbine, M1 Grand receiver, that is made from 8620 resulfurized. And the reason they did it is because as the war progressed, it's very difficult to machine 
the 8620, even though in our day standards it's easy to machine, but back then they didn't have much in the way of carbide tools. And they had continual issues in the tool room with keeping cutters sharp and by adding a small amount of sulfur and increase the machinability of the steel. So like I said, it's a blessing and a curse. There, 4150 resulfurized, I didn't want to use it. I wanted to use chrome moly vanadium. It's an excellent steel. Okay. You'll notice the profile of this. This is the standard government profile. This is generally not used on Geisley Super Duty rifles. Government profile is thin here and thick here, which is exactly opposite of your intuition where you would think that you'd want to take some of this steel and put it over here for more balanced stiffness. I have not found anyone in the United States Army, any of the arsenals who can tell me why this is that way, but I believe it is due to what the Army terms rough handling, and that means a bayonet lug put on the flash hider or a soldier using the barrel as a step or a pry bar or something like that. I believe that's why this is the opposite way of what I'm going to call best practices. But Geisley does it a little bit different, but this is true to the government form. It's manganese phosphate coated. This coating was developed slightly after World War I, and this coating is extremely easy to apply. We can uh, basically, for I'm going to call it pennies, Magfos, pallets of parts. It's very straightforward once they're prepped properly. And manganese phosphate grows a sponge on the outside of a barrel or any part that is put on like the bolt carrier. It doesn't have any corrosion resistance inherent to the coating, but the sponge absorbs gun oils that have corrosion resistant constituents. And that gun oil is what provides the corrosion resistance to the barrel. So this is mil spec manganese phosphate coated. You'll notice the gas block. It's a Geisley gas block, 17-4 stainless steel nitrided. And the gas system is a Geisley exclusive extended mid-length. This provides the optimum gassing for a 16-inch barrel. Many gun makers don't want to move away from the standard carbine or mid-length or rifle length gas systems because it's very easy to call up a supplier of the gas tubes and say, send me please 300 carbine or mid-length gas tubes and they come to your door. Where Geisley goes through the engineering in order to optimize the bolt carrier speed for the cartridge, its intended use and length of the barrel. And through our calculations, we come out with an optimum port size an optimum place for the gas port. And then we have to go and we have to engineer our own gas tube, but this optimizes the weapon system. This gas system length provides a very soft shooting and perceived recoil reduction in the ALG El Jefe gun. At the end, a standard A2 flash hider. Down the road, we will have... An OSS potential. Um suppressor ready muzzle device sometime this fall right? and possibly a and dead possibly air possibly dead air yeah i believe so so we will have suppressor ready muzzle devices ready to go at some time in the future sometime this fall all right let's go to our sling we provide a mill spec we, we get this from a uh, military supplier this is the m4 carbine spring spring with steel QD and an M-lock QD attachment for the rail. So you're ready to go. You don't even need to buy a sling for this guy. All right, let's get it over here, Kevin. See my big belly there, I'm trying to focus <laughs> it, it in. There we go. All right. Now, the cherry on top, okay, of everything. All right, I'm going to show you the original this guy right here kevin i'm going to need the camera this is a telescopic sight from world war one there's a great book it's called a rifleman went to war it is the sniper's bible it's by herbert mcbride herbert mcbride was a uh, sniper and since he wanted to get into the war as early as possible he joined the Canadian Army and served in the Princess Patricia Regiment. 
I believe that regiment still exists in the Canadian Army. And he fought on the Western Front. He was also a high power rifleman. Just get closer, Kevin. There you go. Sorry, Kevin. I'll hold it out. Well, now you gotta go to the hey, back. There we go. Wait, okay. let me turn it to the light. Okay? This is the telescopic sight that he used. I'll read it for you. Telescopic musket sight, model of 1913, the Warner and Swayze Company, Cleveland, Ohio. All right, so this was one of the first sniper sights. And I'll tell you something notable that I, uh, um, I remember from his book. He said sniping on the Western Front was like pulling an early relay at Seagirt. And if you're a high-power shooter, that has meaning. The first national matches were not at Camp Perry. They were in Seagirt, New Jersey. My father uh, was a National Guardsman in the Horse Cavalry, if you can believe that, in the 1930s. And that's where his basic training was, in Seagirt, New Jersey. And when you shot in Seagirt, you shot into the ocean. And, of course, it was facing east. And as the sun came, came up, the sun was in your eyes. So the first national match rifleman had to deal with the sun in their eyes early in the morning, and it was the exact same way they faced for early morning sniping as they, sni as they shot at the Germans on the Western Front. And this is the sight he used. And he used a Ross rifle, uh, very accurate World War I rifle, but notably a little bit unreliable due to sensitivities with the bolt head and dirt ingress and things like that. So Warner and Swayze has been resurrected and on this gun is a Warner and Swayze red dot sight. Okay, it's a 3MOA dot. Here, Kevin. Very long battery life. You'll see the Warner and Swayze logo. It also has a shake awake feature. The dot is extremely bright and crisp. You'll notice the battery box has a big Phillips head on it. You'll also notice the fences around the adjustment points. It's not exposed in case something hits that. It's not going to hit your adjustment buttons right there for your sight. And you'll notice on top it has a pair of iron sights. Looks very much like a, you'll notice the, uh, here Kevin, you'll notice the serrations on the back and on the front. All right, the inspiration of this was some of the national mat sights and combat sites you see on 45s and the front sight was taken from the inspiration of it was the model M27 Smith & Wesson Highway Patrolman in uh, 357 Magnum. That's the, the actual profile of that. And what's the reason for that? It looks pretty dumb, right? It's a very short sight radius. Well, it actually works pretty decent. Now, are you going to, Abraham, how far did you shoot these things to? 100 yards, all right? You can hit a nipstick at 100 yards with this. At 15 yards, it's perfectly regulated. It's dead nuts on the guns that, that we have tried this on, especially on El Jefe. And you don't have to have a separate backup iron sight that's on your gun that adds more expense, or you have to dismount your main sight in case there's a problem. Uh, there actually are instances where this has to be done. They're rare, but it does happen. I'll give you one. I was talking to a special operations uh, soldier who got a bullet in his Trijicon ACOG, and he had to unscrew the sight, and his backup iron sight saved the day as he engaged people who were shooting at them with RPGs from a rooftop. First-hand knowledge actually did happen. Second, for a law enforcement officer, this is important. Case in point, the Alaska State Troopers, as I talked to them about gun configurations, they were adamant that their guns had to have a, a backup iron sight on it. Specifically, they liked the A2 front sight that was permanently mounted because they sometimes can go from cold weather into a heated house and their optics will fog up as they conduct a SWAT raid. And they had to have something. And this is the perfect solution right here immediately in an emergency you just bring your head up and you have a very nice sight picture that works perfectly the mount on this is very secure and robust you'll notice it right here with two oversized cross bolts and the dot is extremely clear and this rifle comes with it for eleven hundred and ninety nine dollars
Okay. What's next? Do you want to talk about? We got a lot of guys asking about the stuff behind you. Do you want to go over the All right, wait. accuracy of this first? Yeah, accuracy. Okay. Let's start with that. All right, how's this shoot? Now. <laughs> That's a big question. I need the, I need the uh, Mendeleev's table, okay? That. See, you hesitated, didn't you? You said Mendeleev. All right. <laughs> it's a chrome line barrel on this guy. How come? I could not put a chrome line barrel on it. True combat weapons are chrome lined. In your homework tonight, you will understand why chrome lining is necessary. Yes, there will be homework, and you are required to read it for one of our next live stream, streams where we talk about. Bill, you said you could not put a chrome line barrel on it. No. You had to put a chrome line I had to put a chrome line barrel on it, all right? And your homework will explain why. He could All right, I got you. I'll get that at the end of the, <laughs> at the end of the, uh, at the end of this live stream. Chrome is the de facto best way of coating the inside of a gun barrel, all right? And here, all right, you see the periodic table, all right? Can we just use this one? Okay. Uh, I can try. Yeah, hang on. Just put it down here. See all, all right. right. So these are elements, um, yeah. and the elements are the, are, are the fundamental basic building blocks of matter, and they can't be reduced to any other constituents. These are the things that God created the world out of, and these are the things that we have to use. There's nothing else other than this. You see, when I called at Mendeleev's table, that Matt hesitated. That's why, the reason why is that this table was invented in 1869 by Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian chemist. And if you've ever worked around Russian technical people, they don't refer to it as a periodic table. They say Mendeleev's table, and when they first said that, I was like, huh? So you gotta get used to calling it if you ever work with Russian scientists or engineers. This is a particular point of pride for them. I think they learn it in grade school, just like we learned how awesome William Penn was and how we laid out the streets of Philadelphia around here. We all learned it in third grade. All right, so these are the things that God gave us and what are the things that you can coat a gun barrel with that work well, all right? Well, you certainly can't use hydrogen, all right? You certainly can't use nitrogen. All right, you look zinc, that's not gonna work. All right, you certainly can't use uranium. All right, but the one here is a very helpful and useful element, and it's right there, chromium, and that's what God intended you coat gun barrels with at this specific point in time. Now there's other coatings, nitriding, which is a good coating. It's very economical to use. It's a lot e easier and cheaper to put on. It's corrosion resistant. It doesn't change the size of your gun barrel. Chrome does. Chrome goes on about seven, ten thousandths of an inch. And you have two options of chroming a gun barrel. You can make it to size, and you can electro etch the material away, and then replace it with chrome. Or you can make your gun barrel oversize, and you can shrink it down. With the you have to be, what's that? With the chrome. With the chrome. <laughs> However, this is not a fully Easy. developed process and there can be mistakes and issues and any time you've always heard the old rifleman adage you know a chrome lined barrel is less accurate than a barrel that's not chrome lined we've changed that all right this is traditional mil spec chrome lining you'll see other guns that we have that are probably the most accurate semi-automatic rifles built ever in, in our history but this is mil-spec chrome lining. It's about 7 tenths to 1 thousandths of an inch thick. It does, it can be thicker on one side, thinner on the other side. It can do other weird things inside. But chrome is resistant to the erosive hot gases inside a barrel. Your, your cleaning rod went out, wear, wear it out. It's corrosion resistant, and you'll see in your homework why this is very important. It has a, it's non-fouling, all right? There's a particular um, phenomena that occurs with stainless steel or non-coated barrels with semi-automatic rifles that are slightly overboard called velocity increase. You may not have heard it, but if you jam on a gun like 6.5 Creedmoor, you're going to get to, even though you clean it at about 400 rounds, your pressures are going to start to go up. And, and, and as your pressures grow up, go up, you're going to have pop primers, issues like that. Chrome lining eliminates that. 
chrome lining is the best coating right now for a gun barrel. I have to put it on here, and that's a chrome lined gun barrel. All right. Okay. So let me show you some Again, targets. Accuracy. Okay. You want to do that one last? Yeah, I'll do that one last. All right. <laughs> here we go. You want to 77 IMI, probably some of the best uh, match grade ammunition out there. The Israelis really knocked it out of the park. Um, I really would like there. to sell this, but the Israelis won't sell it to me. Um, okay. Next one. Talk to them at Shot Show, and they kind of, I don't know. Didn't work out, but it's excellent ammunition. There's another one. All right. Here's another one. 77 IMI. Remember, this is match grade ammo. When you move to M193, uh, M855, it's going to open up. Also, the cheap Russian Wolf ammunition, that's going to be a lot larger than this. However, this gun will run with it. Also, so everyone knows, these are one inch squares on this target. So one that is squares. a sub MOA group right there. Okay. So here's probably one of the best groups. All right, you'll notice this, Kevin, El Jefe. And by the way, they were shot at 100 yards. 100 yards, all right. Mm -hmm. So let's see this. The shooter here was uh, Ben Gold. He's one of our top gunsmiths. He is the number one geyser shooter, but sometimes the giant Texas belt buckle is taken away from him. All right, so they go in and out here about who's the number one best shooter. But as you can see, this group... It's only shot with his Ukrainian Lucky Charm. Ben is an excellent PRS shooter, but he shoots like a house on fire when his beautiful Ukrainian girlfriend accompanies him to the matches. <laughs> All, right, All right, what do we got next? All right. Uh, do you want to go into the other barrel making technologies? Do you want to talk about that? Or you want to yeah, leave? let's go into barrel technology. All right, you can understand where the button rifle comes in. You've seen the button and how, how that works. All right, here is, Kevin, sorry to keep calling you over like that. All right, here is a Hammer Forge rifling mandrel with... Very shiny, you got to get your hand behind it or something. There you go. Okay, there you go. There you go. All right, and if you look at the end, the cylindrical end, you'll see the rifling... What? There we go. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Get it behind your arm. Here? Yeah, just up against something. There you there go. There we go. See the rifling? All right. This is an extremely complicated piece of tooling. It's made out of solid carbide. Um, we make these in-house here at Geisley. Our tool makers, I have a cadre of tool makers who can do this. What happens here is the metal is displaced around this in a hammer forge machine. We have two hammer forge machines. Large and small. Everybody's commenting on the Seiko. Your watch. All right. I'm wearing a Seiko <laughs> for a reason, okay? There's a reason for that. How do you look at Geisley and how do you look at ALG Defense, all right? This Seiko was given to me by my wife on my birthday this year. It's a very nice watch. Keeps time well, looks beautiful. It's made from 316L stainless steel. Very common stainless, excellent corrosive environments, salt water. You can call up your local steel supplier, order bars of it to your heart's content. You can go on Amazon, you'll find bars on Amazon. Very nice watch. We, that's ALG Defense, the Seiko. It's not a Timex, not a plastic case watch, not cheap, but it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, nice watch. Geisley, if I may be so presumptuous, is the Rolex of the gun industry, all right? Rolex spares no expense with their watches. Their stainless steel is 904L. I tried to get some of this stainless steel here in the United States because I wanted to see what it was like, how it would be machined, could it be used on, everybody's laughing, I know I'm gonna get excoriated for this, but this is how I look at things, all right? Do you know I could only find it at a steel supplier out in the Midwest and they only had a 12 inch bar that was one inch in diameter? That's it. And they wanted something like 450 bucks for this little chunk of steel. It's very rare. Rolex must buy it from the mill. That's the difference. Rolex spares no expense to make their watches. Seiko, although a beautiful watch, is made at a price point. And that's how you can look at the two companies. All right, so let's go back to how gun barrels are made. These, this is a hammer forge. You'll notice this part of the, of the uh, mandrel looks like the chamber. And Matt, if you want to hold that up. 
Uh, do you want to get closer or do I mean Kevin, maybe? Can look in at this area. Yep. There's the chamber right there. It's forged into the barrel. When it's forged into the barrel, it's extremely straight into the rifling. So you'll notice right you'll notice the throat and uh, lead area is extremely consistent, extremely smooth. If you look into a gun barrel of lower quality that's been cut with a reamer, you'll notice defects, grooves from that reamer. And as you can see, that is absolutely a mirror finish. And that's one of the reasons why Hammer Forge barrels and Geisley guns work so well. And we'll take that blank right there and we'll turn it into the profile of the gun barrel. A lot of advantages to hammer forging and the old adage that hammer forging doesn't produce a good gun barrel. That's because it's not precision hammer forge on Geisley's two hammer forges with tooling made by our cadre of tool makers. We actually have the forges named. The little one is Isolda, all right, from the Tristan and Isolda opera by Richard Wagner. It's a medieval legend about a prince and princess. I don't know if she was a princess. Maybe she wasn't, but I think he was. And the big one that can do a 50 cal barrel is named Brunhilda. All right, again, she is the, the typical, when the fat lady sings, she has the horns on her helmet. So there are two different hammer forges. They both have names with giant names above them here at Geisley. One of these days, we'll do uh, a factory we'll, tour or something. A factory tour. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of proprietary stuff that I don't necessarily want our competitors to see because they'll drool all over it. <laughs> and um, you don't necessarily want to see that, so I have to work that out. Do you want to show how accurate the forge barrels are? All right. We're going to need Kevin for that one, probably. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say this. I believe that this is history right here that you're going to be looking at. In the history of weapons, there has not been a semi-automatic combat grade rifle in a, in, a, in a high power cartridge that shoots like that gun up there. You'll see it right there. All right. It. You want it? You can pick it up. Absolutely. Show it to him. Whoops. Hey now. My bad. Clear. All right, what you're looking at here, again, you're looking at U.S. military history right here. This has been selected by the United States Special Operation Command as their new semi-automatic sniper rifle. This has been a three and a half year project where we competed against the titans of the gun industry with what we call Project Joy. And this rifle right here won the competition with its Geisley double wall suppressor and it shoots extremely well and I'm going to show you the targets right here all right this is typical grouping in 6.5 Creedmoor from this gun in a cold hammer forged in a cold hammer forged chrome line barrel chrome line barrel and that means it's combat grade so when the United States Navy did its testing of joy I shouldn't say joy there's another name for it which I'll tell you right now Abraham they shot over 25,000 rounds through, through, Three through our guns. guns. Yep. Three guns got 6,400 rounds yep. through each one, over 19,000 rounds. They were going to stop at 5,000 rounds. They're looking for barrel life. This continued to 6,400 rounds, and at 6,400 rounds through the three guns, the groups war were 0.97, 0.76, and 0 0.49. 0 0.49. Average on a piece of paper. Average of a magazine full of 6.5 Creedmoor cartridges. All right? This has not been done before. Look at the Soviet Union. And we ran out of ammo. I and mean, then we ran out of ammo. Yeah. All right? <laughs> so, or they ran out of ammo, I should yeah. say. All right? Soviet Union has the SVD. Okay? If you've ever shot one of those, it's not very accurate. With all the pretty smart people in Russia, all right? The best that they could do was a gun that shoots a couple minute of angles and probably has an effective engagement range with that scope that they have, 450 yards. This gun can be shot out to the maximum effective range and it's sub MOA all the way. It also doesn't have a firing schedule. That means you can shoot it like you're shooting TV sets and junk at the back 40 with your AR-15 just ripping away. <laughs> One of the tests that the Navy did was this, okay? 
they loaded up 12 20 round magazines and they shot all 12 magazines at one round a second 240 rounds slapping the mag in and shooting again after that they let the gun cool and they did it again and they did it again this gun can handle that we're going to go on a live stream with this later on but this is a new genera of rifles and SOCOM has given it a mark designation. It is the Mark I Mod Zero. This is the floor of the new rifles for United States Special Operations Command. Right here, you're viewing it right now. This is history. More, All right. More to come in the future. More to come. No, no, no. We got to we got to talk about the next barrel, cut rifle. All right. <laughs> you're looking at a. Uh, Before you start on cut rifle. Did, yeah. we or did we not buy Hawk Hill? No, we no, didn't. No, we did not buy Hawk Hill. No. Hawk Hill makes very good rifle barrels. They were sold, I think, to an outfit out in Oklahoma. All right. And the equipment was moved to Oklahoma. Look, as, you, as we did gun barrels, we recognized something about button rifling. There's a certain way to do it. And as you get into the very nuances of accuracy, it can be difficult to hold size because of variations in your lots of barrel steel, small variations in hardness. Even in from blank to blank, there is a size tolerance that well, I was a little bit too uncomfortable with for absolute accuracy. So we wanted to cut rifle a barrel. Cut riflers are pretty much non-available. Most of the cut riflers out there use Pratt & Whitney machines from World War II. Sign bar machines, they're completely mechanical. So Matt led the effort with two of our extremely good engineers to design and build in-house a Geisley cut rifler machine. Just All right. one? But we don't have just one, <laughs> I have six. I have another four right behind it, and I have another four behind that. So we have a row of cut rifler machines, and they all have names too. And they are named, Abraham help me out here. Linda Lou. Linda Lou, and if you gotta guess where that comes from. Roxanne. Roxanne, which I wanted to name my daughter Roxanne, but I was, not allowed. not allowed to. <laughs> and yes, no. Destiny. Which is Matt's wife's name. <laughs> all right. So they all have very nice girl names and they're sitting above the cut riflers and these are in-house CNC controlled. They're not mechanical. If I want a different rifling twist on it, I just punch it in and I can make a one and eight. If I want to change the next one to one and eight and a half, it literally takes 10 seconds to do. This is our own tooling. Everything on it is created in-house. I'll show you how the rifling is made. You Kevin, see all that big stuff. Kevin, okay, we're going to need you from here. All right, you're, you're going to be hardly able to see that. Can I put it in my palm? No, that's okay. Let me hold it. You should be able to see it. No, no, no. Put it in your hand. All right, see it? There it is. I actually don't want to show the end of it because it's very proprietary how we do this. But this little cutter right here shaves one ten thousandths of an inch off of the rifling in a pass. Then it index to the next one and shaves one ten thousandths of an inch off. And then the next one. It takes approximately 40 minutes to cut rifle a barrel. But you can get the barrel exactly on size. Shortly before we reach size, the barrel technician checks the size of where the cut rifle is cut to, and then he adjusts it to bring it exactly on size. One of the things we found is that most bullets have a negative tolerance, and even though it's supposed to be a, let's say, a uh, .243 bullet, a lot of times they're .2428, .242, sometimes seven, and we found that lowering the groove size just a couple tenths and nailing that bullet diameter does wonders for accuracy. And we have our own cut rifle barrels. These have been in our GFR. You want to see Abraham's? system all right i'll show you one right here all right this one's very heavily used and abused yep all right this is uh the count's rifle all right you may have heard of count blemula who walks around the shop and picks up all the uh, blem parts and we have our blem sales at our sales this is his prs gun uh, he has uh so far at the geisley mountain won every prs match except two with this rifle and I'm happy to say that the uh, other rifle that won was shot by 
Dean, one of our design engineers, with a six millimeter arc, 16 inch barrel that is for a US military submission. Mm -hmm. It rocks. This is the, the Count's rifle right here. You'll see it's named Vicky. This is after the Roman goddess Victoria, who is synonymous with victory. That's what he named it after. You'll see the, the diameter barrel. This is our cut rifle barrel. 20 inch cut rifle. 20 inch barrel. cut rifle. We call it Strato Match. You'll notice the break. This is our Suave number six, Suave. All right, again, my dialect of Spanish. That is how a gringo says Suave for soft. All right, <laughs> because this break is designed to protect the ears of the shooter with differentially focused gas arrays. Does a very good job, but it's bad for the shooter next to him. All right, you'll notice on this side, it has a hand stop, Magpul UBR right here. This is an extremely accurate barrel that sh shoots sub MOA all day long with a Geisley cut rifle barrel. And here is a gunsmith barrel, which we're going to be coming out with soon. You'll notice the end. This is a 308. One in, ten. one in ten twist. There we go. That's it right there. Our goal here is to produce these and have them in stock. So we want to make the days of wanting to build a bolt gun barrel, a bolt gun for PRS or hunting and target shooting. If you want a one in seven twist, 25 caliber, we're going to have those blanks in stock. That's our goal. That's why we have so many cut riflers. And you'll be able to, within two weeks, at the max, hopefully these will all be in stock, you'll be able to, to order a cut rifle barrel that shoots extremely well. And we have a target somewhere. Yeah, I'll show you some typical groups that people have been getting from these guns. This one's a 6.5. All right, 6.5 Creed. All right. This is a factory 140 grain Hornaday ELD. Okay, so for a while, you'll see this group down here that's five rounds. Jay was our number one Godsley shooter right yeah. here. Okay. Anyone who follows our Instagram saw JB as the number one shooter last week. That was uh, Jay that was here. Jay. You see that little, that's five bullets. Okay, that's out of our barrel. Jay, what ammo did you use? 140 ELD, Hornaday. day. Factory ammunition. Yep. Okay. We want to talk about things on the wall. Uh, let me see what else. Joe, what are quick. people asking? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of questions about the stuff behind you. So, I mean, Which I'll side do you want to start on? I, I say go to the right side. You want to jump down here? Right. Here. Yeah. Yep, go there. All right. Matt, you can take over. All right. All right. Weapons clear. This is a 14.5 6 arc. Uh, Difference in this versus what you just looked at. Coming over, Kim. Go ahead. Um, Shine it towards this. Sorry. Angle towards that. There you go. Yeah. All right. So this is our 14.5 uh, inch cold hammer forged chrome lined six millimeter arc. Um, this is our uh, super whipper wheel uh, single wall suppressor. That's a Geisley suppressor. And then this is our uh, Geisley buttstock. How much detail you want to go into about this? Hold it towards that light. That light. There you go. Oh, there we go. All right. This That's has a, a combination with the six millimeter arc. It's a sniper rifle, and yet it's also an assaulter. Again, even the short barrel mm -hmm. doesn't affect accuracy. This is a sub minute gun, mm -hmm. and it has a chrome line barrel on it for very long, mm -hmm. long barrel life. And just in case you want to know, I don't want to discuss it too much. Six millimeter arc is in use by the U.S. military and has been extremely effective. Okay. I we'll personally... Have another, we'll have another stream about these later. Yeah, we're yeah, going to stream about these. Um, you know, Bill was talking about the accuracy. These are very accurate. You know, all of us here at Geisley have personally reached out to very interesting distances with this, well over 800, 900 meters out of a 14.5 inch carbine. So we'll get to that in an in a st upcoming stream. Uh, you want to go down the wall? Yeah, I think everybody would be interested in Oh, do we want to share this one? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So at SHOT Show, Geisley has a uh, range day for our military and government customers um, at a private range. And um, 
I was very, very much prideful of our MRGGS Mark I Mod Zero, even though it wasn't known by that then. And I thought that everybody was going to gravitate to this 6.5 Creedmoor gun that you could reach out. The farthest target we had was 900, Joe, and... Uh, 950, 857, 656. So I thought it would be very popular, and it was very popular. However, this little guy was the most popular on the range. <laughs> Definitely stole the And show. everybody and their brother gravitated to this gun. And what is this guy right here, all right? This is called GFW, yep. all right? The, the pistol version will be called G. F W two. We were going to call GDP. What does that stand for? All right. If you're in the military, angle towards the light. There we go. Okay. If you're in the military, this is the Geisley fighting weapon. That's what GFR stands for. Mm -hmm. If you're not in the military, it stands for Geisley freedom weapon because yeah. we are not allowed to give scary names to guns anymore. All right. You'll notice the stock. It is a two-stage stock, very much like our two-stage triggers. This is easy to open, difficult to close intentionally. You'll notice the bars do not interfere with the safety. And you'll also notice, Matt, if you want to get a cheek weld on this, you have a cheek weld. Instead of two bars like an MP5 where you can't get your cheek on it, you now have a cheek weld. This stock is machined completely out of aircraft aluminum. It is not plastic. All the hardware is 17-4 pH nitride to stainless steel. The barrel is 8 inches long, and you'll notice it does not have any booster like the Russian Krinkov gun, which is designed to add dwell time to short barrels. Short barrels have always been an issue with short, barrel, with, uh, short ARs. They're known to be unreliable. They're known to have excessive rates of fire and automatic exceeding a thousand rounds per minute almost exceeding the capability of the magazine spring in order to keep up with it violent recoil gas in the face etc this has a new gas system mm -hmm. and this is a patented gas system by Geisley. it's called phased array and what that means is this has three gas ports phased means that it is at 120 degree intervals around the barrel so you have one on top and two on the sides. It is also, that, I'm sorry, that is the array. The phasing is that these are phased down the barrel. You have your top one, then this one goes out, and then the other one goes out further. So this does a, a lot of different things. One, the gas ports are a lot smaller, so your bullet does not extrude into your gas ports and gets damaged. The damage is also concentric around the three points, whatever small damage that it is, so your bolt is not imbalanced. The phasing down the barrel makes the bolt carrier head back with a soft push rather than something like a ball peen hammer hit. A mm -hmm. uh, piston gun, any piston gun like the HK416, it's seriously like a ball peen hammer. It doesn't push the bolt carrier back. When you see that piston hit the carrier on the high speed video, it launches back and the piston stays in place. Literally, it's like a hammer. A DI gun is much better. It's a slower pushback. But as you get to shorter barrels, the high pressure, since you're so close to the chamber, just overruns and causes all kinds of problems. And when this is a fully automatic machine gun, Matt, what does it run at? Uh, right around 750 to 800. That's, that's pretty darn slow. All right, and that's, a, yeah. and that's when we put a suppressor on it. If you don't put a suppressor on it, it's more like 650. Mm -hmm. All right, and you don't need a booster on the end of this thing. It's extremely controllable. It's an extremely nice weapon that is dead reliable. And the ejection, you can tell how reliable it is because the ejection is at four o'clock. Yep. It does an excellent job of it. So we're going to have another live stream on this. That's of shooting demos. We'll show you some really cool things. And I think we're going to find our last Geisley gas pedal selector that Matt keeps in his desk for safekeeping and we're going to install one of these and we're going to show you what that does. Okay. Two, uh, two questions. Will okay. we have the uh, stocks available separate and what calibers? I'll start with calibers. Uh, right now it's in a 5.56 and we are working on a 300 blackout also. Well, and I'll answer the question on the stocks. We will uh, eventually. eventually. It will be a part of a kit because it has
has a specific yeah. bolt counter. We'll get into more specifics about the gun in the live stream that's for this gun. Uh, there's a lot more in, into it than what you can see. It's got a custom bolt carrier, which would have to come with the stock, which we will sell as a kit. Um, there's a lot, we'll kind of get into that as we get into our, our next live stream on this. Um, this is the civilian version, if anyone's looking. If you saw the close-up, this doesn't have the select fire. So this will be the one that will be for sale. Uh, it'll be an SBR, uh, so you will have to get yourself a tax stamp to get it. Um, and then the, obviously the law enforcement version comes in select fire. And there will be a pistol version too, um, which will have a tube that'll look something like that, um, that you cannot shoulder or put to your cheek. <coughs> Next, going over here. Yep. All right, you want to start at the top or bottom? To the other side. Start at the top. Starting at the top. BBB is the color. Burnt bourbon, bourbon barrel, barrel brown. brown. Okay, this is a new anodized color. You'll notice that most, almost all guys' guns are not painted or Cerakoted. We like Type 3 hard coat mill spec in colors. And this is going to be a special line of barrels, um, bourbon barrel brown. We wanted to call it... Um, Hershey Brown, but I don't think the chocolate company out in Hershey, Pennsylvania would be very keen on us using that. But <laughs> Bourbon Barrel Brown, that's the color. Uh, beautiful color. And what, what okay. length barrel is that? 14.5. Uh, 14.5 14 pinned and welded. Yep. We will be offering 50 of each of these colors only. Okay. Limited time edition. Mm -hmm. They will be available in the next few weeks. And, Are uh, we going to do a separate stream for these or no? We'll have a separate stream. All right, once separate stream. Live. All right. And here we have a beautiful teal blue. Um, it is modeled after Tiffany blue. However, the company that owns the Tiffany trademark would probably send airborne commandos and a C-130 gunship to tear me up if we called it Tiffany blue. So it is called Tessa blue. All right, Tessa blue. Beautiful. You can pick one up for your wife. She'll love it. We promise. Uh, this one's also 14.5, pin and welded. Again, this is not a paint. This is an anodized color. All right. This one, your wife's favorite color, right? This is Agent Orange. This is the color of my PRS gun, which as is well a, as mine. Which is a with Matt's. PRS gun too. Mine is a 22 inch cut rifle Geisley barrel with an integral ARCA rail and this is called Agent Orange. Stands out at the range. You'll notice the slight differences in the color. This is just anodizing and the gremlins that are in every anodized tank, there's absolutely no way to keep it perfectly consistent. But beautiful gun and um, it's, uh, you can see it a mile away. This one's in a 16 inch in this configuration um, and they all have our proprietary guys, they muzzle device on them, which we'll get into more detail uh, in the uploads for these guns. Okay. Pretty much it. Sign up, sign up for all of our socials, our email list, to keep a lookout for uh, upcoming live streams. Our book, Abraham. All right. Here we go. Your homework. <laughs> you can pick this up from Amazon, Shots Fired in Anger. Okay. My major, John B. George, he was an Army rifleman involved in the cleanup of Guadalcanal. He was also a national match shooter who shot at Camp Perry. And he had a, uh, not a custom, but a very hand-selected 1903 Springfield that he talks about here with an, uh, a uh, uh, Lehman Alaskan scope. And this is an extremely good read for anybody who wants to be a firearms designer. It heavily influenced me and in how I look at firearms design and of course the uh, future battlefields of the United States which most likely are going to be back in the Pacific and how um, I'll talk about how we have changed the design of Mark 1 Mod 0 to reflect the new realities that we're going to be. You can get this on Amazon. Amazon. It's pretty cheap. This is a reprint. Unfortunately I don't think it has the illustrations of the original book 
but extremely good book. This is your reading list for probably a month from now, so you got plenty of time. Shots Fired in Anger, excellent book. All right, we're going to end this with the words of my mother, my late mother. She was a medical doctor, a physician. Her specialty was psychiatry. And as she looked at my first video and, she, and it came to the end, her comment to me was, Billy, if these people listen to you, they're crazy. <laughs> and that's the truth because she was a psychiatrist that she could determine if someone was mentally ill or not. Bill Geisley and Matt Sibio signing off from North Wales, Pennsylvania. Good night, everyone. <laughs>